Edmonton 911 emergency for police, fire, or ambulance? Police, please. And what's the emergency? Um, it's a long story. I woke up. There's a girl in my bathroom, friggin' covered in blood. Cindy Gladue's name should not be ever, ever forgotten. So she needs an ambulance then, sir? I don't know. I don't know. I never had You know, it's basically sending a message of impunity that it is okay to kill an Indigenous woman or to kill a sex worker and walk away free. She came in. I was in a hotel, and she, we're all partying that. I felt that maybe, you know, I, I wasn't sure that I believed his story, put it that way. And she went back and had a shower, and I fell asleep on my bed, and I woke up this morning, and she's laying in the tub with blood all over the place. An Ontario trucker has been set free by a jury in Edmonton after being found not guilty of first-degree murder and the death of an Indigenous woman working in the sex trade. Protesters are angry the court allowed Gladue's genitals, which were preserved by the medical examiner, to be shown at Barton's trial. If she hadn't been Aboriginal, they would never have done that. They've never dared to do that. The justice that we seek for Cindy Gladue is, I hope, on its way. She liked to cook, and I remember sitting on her lap and watching cooking shows with her. She liked to help people as much as she could. Me and my sisters were close to my mom. We told her everything. I miss her so much. My mother had an amazing heart. I miss her so much. She died a day before my birthday. You never deserved anything like that. Nobody deserves anything like that. Alone, slowly bleeding to death in a dingy Edmonton hotel bathtub, while the man who did this to you sleeps on the other side of a thin wall. Her three daughters, who wrote those touching words, know the terrible details. Old enough to remember, too young to be motherless. It was June 20th, 2011, and Cindy Gladue's boyfriend at the time was here at Lucky's Lounge, where he met a long-haul truck driver named Bradley Barton. Barton had said that he wanted to be with a woman. So the boyfriend went home, got Cindy, brought her back here, introduced the two. She emerged a short time later with $60 and came back to meet him again the next day. Cindy's struggles with alcohol and crack cocaine compelled her to sell her body. They met in the lounge. That's them there at the top of the screen. The server brings them drinks. They had many more before leaving. Here they are heading to his hotel room. Barton asked a co-worker, this man, if he wanted in on the action. The man declined. So Barton and Cindy went to his room. She never left. Edmonton 911 emergency for police, fire or ambulance? Police, please. And what's the emergency? Um, it's a long story. I woke up. There's a girl in my bathroom, friggin' covered in blood. Okay, so she needs an ambulance then, sir? I don't know. I don't know. I never had touched her. She came in. I was in a hotel, and she, okay. we were all partying that, and she came back and had a shower, and I fell asleep on my bed, and I woke up this morning, and she's laying in the tub with blood all over the place. An autopsy showed the Cree mother, daughter, and friend died of a horrific injury. An 11-centimeter rupture inside her vagina, she slowly bled to death. During one of the police interviews in the days to follow, Barton was told the surveillance footage shows he lied to 911. Barton eventually admitted he did know the woman who died in his bathtub, but he insisted he didn't know what killed her. It was an act of God, he said. If someone kills someone um, 
while committing a sexual assault, which was what the Crown's allegation, it's, it's, it's first degree murder. The case went to trial in 2015. Tony Blake covered the trial for the Edmonton Sun. Barton was charged with first degree murder. The Crown asserted that Barton intended to kill her by inserting a sharp object inside her vagina. Edmonton police had found a bloody towel that Barton disposed of outside the hotel, but not a murder weapon. The defense said that's because there wasn't a murder. According to the defense, the two had consensual rough sex and she accidentally died. Nobody can consent to violence. Nobody. That's been established by the Supreme Court of Canada and it's been upheld multiple times. Courts have also determined that someone with a blood alcohol content as high as Cindy's cannot legally form consent. Her blood alcohol was 340, more than four times the legal driving limit and in the range of what can be fatal alcohol poisoning. Barton's defense, nonetheless, was that Cindy, cripplingly drunk and bleeding profusely, somehow managed to get out of bed and walk to the bathroom while Barton fell asleep until the next day. The Crown said it was more likely Barton carried the bleeding woman from his bed to the tub and let her die. But they had no proof of that and also no murder weapon. Perhaps it was desperation that led them to make a shocking decision. As I reported at the time, it was believed to be the first time that such an exhibit was, was used in a, in, in a murder case in Canada. The Crown's expert was, was arguing that force was used and there was a terror in, inside the vagina, so he wanted to be able to demonstrate that. And the defense had their own expert and, and she, she was you know, obviously had a different opinion, but she used the exhibit as, as well. Muriel Venn is president of Edmonton's Institute for the Advancement of Aboriginal Women, a group that advocated for Cindy and her family throughout the trial. Of all the things that happened, that was done by the Crown, which is even worse because they calculated it. If she hadn't been Aboriginal, they would never have done that. They've never dared to do that. But her most intimate body part being paraded through a courtroom was not the final indignity. An Ontario trucker has been set free by a jury in Edmonton after being found not guilty of first degree murder in the death of an Indigenous woman working in the sex trade. Horrific in the sense of what the Crown prosecutors did and, and the jury did in acquitting this man who had killed her. Reaction was swift. Protests are being held across the country today. About 1,000 people took to the streets of Edmonton. Cindy Gladue's name should not be ever, ever forgotten. Well, we called it our breaking point because this just spread like wildfire. This protest in Iqaluit was like the protests happening all over the country. The way she was treated and the verdict of the case is a symptom of systemic racism that needs to be addressed in our country. In Winnipeg, a winter storm rolled in as the crowd formed. Some felt the weather was an indication of what they say is the cold-heartedness of the judicial system and the way Canada is treating Indigenous women. You know, with its verdict of an acquittal, sent a message to Indigenous women and to sex workers that their lives are not valued. You know, it's basically sending a message of impunity, that it is okay to kill an Indigenous woman or to kill a sex worker and walk away free. When the verdict came down that Bradley Barton was set free then um, and acquitted of this crime, I called an emergency meeting with our board of directors and we came together within a day and um, decide, made a resolution that we were going to seek justice for Cindy and um, work as closely as we could with the justice system because of course this was a in our eyes a terrible miscarriage of justice after the protest people began scrutinizing the trial how could this have happened police had found barton's laptop contained violent pornographic images the judge in the case had deemed it inadmissible so the jury never got to know that and there was other things the jury didn't hear as well I, I felt based on what I heard, and, and I have to add that I, I heard some things that the jury didn't hear to do with his conduct, that'd be uh, Bradley Barton, sort of after the killing. And 
I felt that maybe, you know, I, I wasn't sure that I believed his story, put it that way. Then there was the way Cindy was repeatedly referred to in court. There were a lot of references to the victim being native and uh, a sex trade worker. And we don't know, but I mean, that could have swayed, swayed the jury, some of the jurors in, in any direction based on the fact that, she, you know, she was there and doing what she was doing. It, it could have negated consent, even though that's legally wrong. The language that was used by um, the lawyers and, and the judge throughout the case to refer to Cindy Gladue uh, was problematic and may have uh, encouraged the jury inadvertently to think about her in, in ways that may have reinforced assumptions about Indigenous women, about sex workers and, and sexual assault. Jennifer Koshin is a University of Calgary law professor. Cindy Gladue, the, the victim in the case, um, was referred to right from the outset of the trial uh, by the lawyers as having been engaged in the sex trade. Um, and that was done without going through the usual application under the criminal code to introduce sexual history evidence. She's referring to Section 276 of the Criminal Code of Canada. Under Section 276, evidence of someone's sexual history is not admissible to support an inference that the complainant is more likely to have consented or is less worthy of belief, without a special hearing first to determine whether or not such evidence is admissible. There was no such hearing ahead of Cindy Gladue's trial in 2015, so her history as a sex worker should not have been used as evidence and parts of her body should not have been carried into an Alberta courtroom. That's the law. All of this was enough for the Crown Attorney to go to the Court of Appeal seeking a new trial. In a scathing decision, the Alberta Court of Appeal ordered a retrial for first-degree murder. Interview requests made through Barton's lawyer, Dino Bados, went unanswered, but a statement on the law firm's website said, I think the Court of Appeal is making a political statement as much as a legal one. It's trying to correct every perceived inequity in sexual assault law in Canada in this judgment, and it went far beyond what the Crown on Appeal was arguing, and that's not fair to Mr. Barton. Bados filed an application for leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. In a news release, he said the appeal court made several mistakes, and given the media attention, the matter deserves to go to a higher court. Cindy's story did make it to the Supreme Court of Canada in 2019, based on the fact that the Alberta courts failed to follow Section 276. The Supreme Court of Canada said the retrial should go ahead. In their decision, the judges wrote, Everyone is equally entitled to the law's full protection and to be treated with dignity, humanity, and respect. Ms. Gladue is no exception. The criminal justice system did not deliver on its promise to afford her the law's full protection, and as a result, it let her down. Indeed, it let us all down. The justice that we seek for Cindy Gladue is, I hope, on its way. The retrial of Cindy's case was set for January of 2021, but there was a catch. The charge of first-degree murder had been dropped. Barton would only be retried for manslaughter. Why? We'll have more on that when we come back. This is the most important case ever within my lifetime. It will be the only case uh, that I can see of such great importance as this one in my lifetime, because uh, it's been a long time coming. Muriel Venn is president of Edmonton's Institute for the Advancement of Aboriginal Women. She's talking about the case of Cindy Gladue, a woman who was killed by an Ontario trucker in a hotel room in 2011. The trucker was acquitted in 2015. Aboriginal women live in a country that is hostile to their very existence. And that is shown in every statistic. Today is the day that many have long fought for. 
It's the opening day into the national inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. It's a historic event. Uh, family members have been waiting for this for a very long time and have been pushing for a national inquiry. And I think today was a positive day. You know, they took uh, family recommendations to heart and I'm hoping they'll be implemented across Canada. The National Inquiry into Murder to Missing Women kicks off in December and is expected to last for two years. Gladue's killer was acquitted in 2015. In 2016, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls began. There's a long way to go, but I feel that women are being recognized as human beings and Canada has yet to recognize the Aboriginal women as human beings. Her agency put together this literature. It's an homage to Indigenous women, to the missing and murdered, to the survivors, to the ones victimized by society and the court system that's set up to protect them. It was inspired by Cindy. The letters written by her daughters, which we heard at the beginning of the show, were published here. This is part of the reconciliation movement that's uh, taking place in this country and this is such a vitally important reconciliation that um, could have long lasting and permanent changes to our way we think about indigenous women and the way we think about indigenous people. The inquiry released its final report on June 3rd, 2019. Ten days before that on May 24th, the Supreme Court ordered a retrial of Bradley Barton for manslaughter in the death of Cindy Gladue. Here's Venn in 2019. They've done good as far as uh, identifying the things that are uh, very much in need of changing, but we want to see them go very much further. At the time, Peter Sankoff was a lawyer for the law firm representing Barton. Here's Sankoff. The entire uh, ground of the trial has shifted a little bit because there's no longer a murder, uh, a verdict being possible, and that changes the dynamic of the trial. And, and as well, everybody's learned some lessons from the first trial, uh, and part of what the Supreme Court was saying is even when they were upholding our positions, they were saying things could have been done better. No person should be subjected to the kind of derogatory remarks that the judge did. I think everybody recognized after the fact that some of the language could have been cleaner, that some things could be done differently. That's the ironic part is that a lot of people, you know, have, have been upset about that and indirectly upset with Mr. Barton for how that occurred. Mr. Barton objected to the admission of that evidence at trial. We tried to get it out and we said it shouldn't go in. So ultimately, whether or not some of that evidence, which so, troubled so many people, is admitted, that's going to be a question for the Crown. The door has been opened now. And we are prepared and are going to be uh, fighting for justice and humanity within the court system towards Indigenous women. The retrial was set for January of 2021, after the MMIWG inquiry, after the Me Too movement. The Supreme Court had ordered that Barton only be tried for manslaughter, not first degree murder. Why? In 2015, the Crown wasn't able to prove that a weapon was used. That's an important difference between first-degree murder and manslaughter. And remember, no one ever found a murder weapon. So it would be manslaughter and only manslaughter. This time, the court had a proper hearing under Section 276 of the Criminal Code. So evidence from Cindy's sexual history was allowed and Barton's. Remember Barton's laptop and how it couldn't be submitted as evidence? This time it could. And court heard that 10 days before his fatal encounter with Cindy Gladue, Barton made at least 10 separate searches for terms like ripped and torn in relation to certain sex acts involving a hand and a woman's vagina. Here's a tracing of Barton's hand from the 2015 trial with a woman's hand for comparison. There was never a knife. The Crown wanted 18 to 20 years for Barton. His defense wanted five to nine. Barton was found guilty of manslaughter in February 2021 and sentenced in July. It only took a day of deliberations before the jury found 52-year-old Bradley Barton guilty of manslaughter. 
Barton could face up to life in prison for his role in Cindy Gladue's death in 2011. The defense and prosecution spoke outside the courthouse. To prove lack of consent means to prove that the victim in her own mind didn't want that to happen. And, I mean, we didn't have a victim here to tell us that. Barton's lawyer, Dino Batos, said there was much sentiment towards retrying after his 2015 acquittal of first-degree murder. The weight of the nation and the judgment of the nation was uh, that they wanted this overturned. So disappointed, not surprised. In the sentencing decision, the judge wrote that Barton took no steps to inform Ms. Gladue of the risks or to request her consent. And told a series of lies to various people, including police officers, in an unyielding attempt to avoid responsibility for Ms. Gladue's death. That's the way precedents are set. I did put my daughter to rest on Friday, 10 years later. Barton was sentenced to 12 and a half years in prison, currently set to be released on February 16th, 2033. For one of Cindy's daughters, however, the pain will remain. And you know, just because justice was served doesn't mean that the heartache will ever go away. That will never change. I think Barton is a very important decision. It gave the Alberta Court of Appeal an opportunity to talk about some of the problems that have existed over time in uh, jury trials in the sexual assault context, um, and also to reinforce how important it is for judges and lawyers who are involved in those sorts of cases to ensure they aren't um, speaking in a way or introducing arguments that uh, may reinforce stereotypes about Indigenous women and about sex workers who are victims of sexual assault. I think we've done a pretty good job, for the most part, at creating a good, strong set of laws. The problem comes more in the application of those laws, and I think that circles back to the need for more training for, uh, for judges and other players in the justice system in these cases to ensure that those laws are being applied appropriately. Judges do get some training when they're first appointed to the bench, and it does include some training on sexual assault law, but I think given many of the, many of the cases that have been before the courts recently that have exposed how that training may not be sufficient, I, I think there's definitely room for, for more. To